Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Recently, the recently released trailer for an upcoming local horror film titled Pulau was met with much criticism online for scenes of actors in bikinis and of appearing to kiss and initiate sex. Scenes that were deemed by some as too explicit and incompatible with the culture and values of Malaysian society. Now, various parties have urged fil the Film Censorship Board to review the approval given to screen the film. To which the LPF responded that film trailers published online fall outside the jurisdiction of the LPF. Now, with a growing array of publishing options from social media to streaming sites, has film censorship been rendered a feeble weapon in contemporary culture wars? My first guest tonight is Datuk Kamil Othman. He was formerly he formerly held the roles of Director General of Finas and Vice President for Creative Multimedia at MDEC. Kamil, thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight. What what do you make of this controversy surrounding the trailer of the film Pulau? Well, I think this is um, a, a very um, Malaysian tradition. It's almost a tradition because it's not the first time. It will not be the I mean it's not the first and it will not be the last. Uh, because of the simple fact that um, the way that we approach censorship is uh, still very much uh, dependent on the individual. And uh, most of our reaction are based on, um, well, I wouldn't say individual per se, but it's on uh, what we call a regimented way of looking at what censorship is all about. Uh, to understand censorship, I mean, you've got to understand that uh, if you look back at its roots, it is actually about a filtration process. And it's a filtration process uh, that controls audio, visual, and themes. So it's not just what you see and what you hear, but it's also what kind of stories you can tell or what kind of uh, areas that you can touch. So with that deep-rooted fear, I mean, I'm talking about the origins, yes, the origins of censorship, that deep-rooted fear that people are easily influenced. And as such, there is a need to do something for the greater good. So the greater good simply means that um, we have to protect. Now, that was the old, the old era, I mean, and I think um, elements of that are still here too. Uh, but we are now in an age where we should look at uh, what we call the contextual censorship or rather contextual filtration. Why? Because in the previous uh, type, it is more like the big brother, a big responsible brother is trying to uh, take care of the family. And because of that, uh, you can see this, you can't see that, you can hear this and you can hear that. But contextual simply means you now bring that very same filtration process within a context. And the context is simply this. Whether something is for the greater good to the majority or whether something is for the greater good for a smaller group who now has the liberty of not having access to the material at all is as simple as switching off the TV, don't look at the channel. Why? Because there are two parallel ways by which Malaysians are now exposed to content. One is the cinema, which is uh, guided by the Censorship Act. I think in 1957, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it has been renewed. But the other is OTT. Right. Yes, so OTT has actually allowed people to actually see what they couldn't see uh, in the cinemas before. Now, within this context, we are now saying that more and more Malaysians have now possibly redefined uh, what is uh, offensive, what is not. And I think that's where the, the, the root cause of the recent uh, trailer, uh, where if for some, even a bikini, is not the right way of um, expressing something, uh, then it is still an issue that we have to address. 
Okay. I, I, I'm curious to understand more about contextual censorship. Um, you know, if, if the idea is the roots were of protectionism, of gatekeeping what can and cannot be, uh, be watched or read or, or listened to, um, if that was the, the origins of it, then how can censorship s remain relevant in, in this age of streaming and o uh, OTT? So um, contextual censorship, would that be classification? Would that be um, education? Would, how has contextual censorship evolved with the times? You are absolutely correct. Contextual censorship is the solution to what we call the traditional for the greater good kind of censorship. Why? Because, uh, as you mentioned, uh, it um, actually brings you into a new era where you are the willing buyer and there's a willing seller. The same thing that applies to all um, everything else that, that we do, consumer goods or whatever, right? So willing buyer, willing seller simply means it is no longer an imposition. And that is the biggest difference. In the former, the one that we're talking about, for which there are still some champions, uh, there are still some champions here because they have not been able to understand the contextual area. So it is still like, uh, you know, the strict parent, the strict parent mentality. It's, it is still there. But the solution is, as you mentioned, education. In a way, what has happened during, let's say, during the COVID, uh, during the pandemic, People stayed home. And guess what were they watching? Almost every other thing on Netflix, <laughs> right? The very same thing that the greater good approach to censorship was trying to circumvent. Mm -hmm. But there was one basic difference. With Netflix, you either subscribe to it or you don't. So willing buyer, willing seller. And even as a parent, now that you have tons of content to watch on Netflix. The parent is the, actually the chief censor in the home. Now, that is what contextual censorship is all about. It brings into perspective that you recognize that different people have different value systems. Some will find bikinis offensive, but some others do not mm -hmm. because it is only beachwear. Uh, nice. Just like, uh, you know, you show someone smoking, a non-smoker would probably be fuming, man. <laughs> <laughs> Doctors might be very upset at that. Uh, uh, context uh, simply means that, uh, let's say if there's an artistic film, that film or that book or that piece of music has won awards everywhere and has been acclaimed. You know, remember like uh, Stanley Kubrick when he made A Clockwork Orange? You have two almost uh, giant, I mean, uh, one is Henry and Burgess, who wrote the book. And then you have Stanley Kubrick, the director. Now, with that kind of film, the solution is contextual because it is something and you bring classification to the picture. Right. Why won't classification, what, will classification work in a Malaysian context? It will work to an extent. It will work to an extent in the sense that uh, as we move along, classification actually defines why it is given that rating. Remember, if you look at the American MPAA system, it tells you it is uh, R restricted because it has elements of this and that and, and so on. So as a guide, now, what we should be doing is actually to start more and more to look at the classification of films here as a guidance for the individual to decide whether they like the subject matter or they don't. Mm -hmm. Now, you may ask also, yeah, but what about those who would only go for the, uh, you know, the risque, the more um, steamy or the more uh, off the beaten path kind of thing? Well. If you can accept education has played its part, all you will see is what we call the rite of passage. And everybody goes through that. Mm. That rite of passage where people are curious and all that. 
the control comes when education has really shaped your opinion or give you a perspective on what other people could also be thinking or doing or their culture or their values. Right. Camille, very quickly, can I ask you, uh, based on your experience working in the film industry, what has been the impact of decades of censorship on the creative arts in film and television? Well, I, um, okay, this is the other thing which a lot of local filmmakers may not agree wholeheartedly. Um, although in principle, I would like to see things made the way the author or the creator has done it. I mean, I, mean, I wouldn't want, uh, like yourself, to read a book where pages have been torn off, right? So that, in principle, that's what we believe in. However, uh, we could also say that you do not necessarily have to abolish censorship or control in order to make good films. Some of the best films uh, voted by critics um, were made in the 60s, uh, late 50s, when censorship was still strict in the West. I mean, I remember in Italy, the Catholic Church was very powerful in determining which is, uh, you know, what is, uh, can be seen and what cannot be seen. So if there is a creative community at all, the creative community will circumvent that situation by being more creative. It's a bit like saying, you know, George Orwell has problem doing, uh, you know, real people uh, in his book, in his comment on the British Parliament, and he decided to do animal fun. So it is there. So to people uh, who says that you need to abolish censorship in order to become more creative, uh, I would say it's a yes and it's a no. In Malaysia today, what we hope is that um, relaxation of censorship would actually mean a relaxation on the kind of stories you can tell. Because remember, censorship is more than just about image and about team. team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a team, it's a story. What kind of stories can we tell? And there again, the other part is uh, with the kind of stories that we've been telling, and some filmmakers have already attempted to do this, we talk about the audience. In my view, the, the average Malaysian uh, audience is still have not come to that stage yet where they could actually consume or digest um, things that are outside the comfort zone. And this is where the education... No, I'm, I'm talking about average uh, viewer right now, or probably their 30s or whatever. The kids are, however, different. The ones that are growing up now, um, I mean, my son is watching Bojack Horseman, <laughs> you know, and he's not even in Form 3 yet. So um, why do I allow it? Because I've seen Bojack Horseman and its animation. But more importantly, behind each story, episode, there's something about life there mm -hmm. which uh, he could catch on, right? And uh, there was one superb episode, uh, which is uh, really, uh, which is about anti-suicide. Uh, it's a poem. It's about someone who jumped from a bridge and then halfway, uh, he was reciting a poem called The View from Halfway Down. So basically, uh, that's the situation we're in. In okay. Malaysia, however, most of the responses towards controversial matters are knee-jerk reaction. Mm. It's, uh, you know, it's out of context. All right. Yeah. Pulau is a trailer and already people are jumping up and down over it. I mean, I would suggest that uh, let's watch the film first. I <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Datuk Kamil Uthman, former DG of Finas there. We're going to take a very quick break here and consider this. We will be back with more. Stay tuned. <music> Hi, 
Hi, welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. Let's continue our conversation about the controversy over the recently released trailer of the local horror film Pulau. The online backlash included calls to ban the film and questions over how it was approved by the Film Censorship Board. Joining me now is film is producer Anna Ha. She's the co-founder and uh, co-founder of Freedom Film Network, which is a non-profit that supports filmmaking for social impact. She's also the festival director of Freedom Film Festival, which is a international human rights uh, film festival based here in Malaysia. Anna, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Uh, the controversy around the trailer for Pulau, what has that highlighted to you, Anna, about the ways in which uh, film censorship is perceived in Malaysia and also how it's exercised here? Yeah, thanks for having me, uh, Melissa. Yeah, I think uh, this Pulau issue, I mean, it's a little bit of, um, I mean, I would say that there were as many positive reactions as they were negative when I see online. But somehow it's the negative um, responses that uh, gets highlighted. So that's very strange because when I read, there's like many people were very excited about the film. Or, oh, you know, this next best thing. And people who didn't watch Malaysian films now want to watch this, you know. So that's something that I noted. Lah. But um, generally, um, it is, I think the call for a ban or a censor is kind of uh, too much, you know. It's too uh, emotional and kind of like a knee jerk. But rather, um, it points to me that it is a problem. It shows that there's a problem with the regulations. They must be vague or the guidelines are not clear. And that should be the thing that we are looking at rather than should we ban, you know, or, you know, is this bad for our morals? But we really should be looking at uh, why these um, regulations uh, are, are, are not simply, is it because the filmmakers don't understand the regulations or, you know, mm. is it not clear? And I think that is the source of the problem. Okay. But the, the, the sorry, uh, the way yeah. that um, we look at films in Malaysia, it is very much like um, films as a reflection values of uh, Malaysian society, and it is the government's role to um, to control, you know, and to protect society from, you know, uh, any harm, public harm. But this 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 um, so-called mindset it stems from uh, the time when from the British when the British were our colonial masters, and they decided that at that point of time they were very um, worried about Amer American propaganda. They were also worried, after that they were worried about communist propaganda, and so this uh, act was kind of like enacted for this purpose to control uh, propaganda that um, you know, the British were afraid of, you know, right. and they right. wanted to control uh, public thought. So, but uh, in the name of um, control, they called it protection, you know. So I think that's where it's coming from. That the sense that uh, we need someone or the government needs to protect us from harm, you know, but when actually, maybe it's just a sense of control. Maybe that was those days. But, uh, you know, the UK has since um, already changed all these laws a long time ago. You know, they're, they're no more looking at this. That's how we're looking at, no? Right. How much you control should protect. Well, the film censorship in Malaysia under the Film Censorship Board is the is under the purview of the Home Ministry. So that, that speaks to the perspective of film censorship through a national security lens. I do want to ask you, Anna, whether you, know, whether you think film censorship with the view of protecting the people from, uh, from you know, or gatekeeping what content the public may, may see, are those decisions political? Uh, I, I feel um, that um, it is very political in Malaysia because uh, the, the, the the system is set up, you know, that first of all, it's under the Home Ministry. And then second, uh, actually, the, minis the minister, the Home Minister is given complete powers to control content. And of course, the minister is a member of parliament and he also is a member of a political party, you see. And um, the minister in Malaysia and the law allows him to select all the board of uh, people from the, I mean, the board of census, everyone from the board of census and also from the appeals board, uh, they are selected by the minister. And on top of that, he can overrule their decisions um, based on his personal 
point of view, you know. Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, there is no judicial recourse in the sense that all decisions made by the board and the minister cannot be um, contested in court. So um, that's why I say it's very political because um, it leaves a lot of room for them uh, maybe uh, content that uh, maybe uh, anti, you know, the political party or doesn't serve a political party's interest then to, you know, be censored by right. the people who have power. Yeah. What impact do you think this has had on um, filmmakers and audiences? I know um, FFN has this initiative called Bebaskan Film Merdeka Kan Minda Rakyat. So I'm just wondering about um, the, the decades of censorship, that impact that has had on filmmaking, on storytelling, and also on audience perception and expectations. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we, we ourselves have been uh, experiencing this um, so-called quite a big impact of uh, film censorship uh, in the society because of the work we do, which is more to do with uh, trying to uh, engage the public to be more active in, you know, things in, in, in around them. Uh, and uh, so after two years, we decided, now the, the past two years, we've been going on this campaign or this initiative called Bebaskan Film. So uh, we, we had produced, I'm going to show you here, uh, two, two uh, but quite in-depth research, okay? So uh, one is on the Film Censorship Act, right? And the other one is on uh, the impact of uh, this act on uh, film producers. And we also did a survey with uh, filmmakers and um, audiences. Mm -hmm. And um, I would, I mean, I mean, just based on the research and on facts, I would say that um, one of the, the, the big thing that I see that actually is, um, society, as we see now, uh, Malaysians or the people that responded, they really um, do not um, want this um, this one aspect, which is um, that criticism of government is not allowed. You know, it's one of the things that is censored in the guidelines. Because if you, uh, cause we look at filmmakers, we look at the, the demand for this kind of content is very high on social media, you know. People want to know what's happening, what they want to hear all this, and they want to hear different point of view. And then here we go, censoring this. So for the filmmakers, it's not only um, not being able to express themselves, but there is a demand for this that they cannot, you know? Right. And this has economic implications as well. Okay, very quickly, Anna, can I ask you? So because um, you, you work uh, with social justice films, does that mean that uh, censorship is stricter for social documentaries, for films that um, you know, spotlight the oppression, the injustices that are suffered by the disenfranchised and marginalized? Yes, uh, definitely. This is again the same guideline where um, criticism of uh, government or uh, things that go uh, maybe uh, kind of uh, against the government policies are not allowed. It's very clearly stated in the law. But it's not about being against government. But when you talk about something like the marginalized community and we, we tend to also want to talk about what are some of the problems that they face and mm. how we could kind of uh, improve this situation. So that is looked upon as criticism when actually it is a uh, part of um, awareness, public awareness, and also maybe uh, helping uh, improve the quality of life for, you know, Malaysians and the general public. Yep. Okay, so we've got a new Home Minister. What, what changes to the existing ecosystem of film censorship would you like to see, Anna, for, from this new government? Yeah, um, I'm really hoping for a lot, but I am also uh, a realist. I think, uh, first of all, is not to treat film as a security issue, mm. you know. So I think the Ministry of Home Affairs is not the best place uh, to park uh, this uh, regulation of film. Uh, number two, um, let's not talk about cuts anymore. It should be towards classification, you know. It should be protecting uh, children, age protection for children, but also uh, ensuring that the adults get to watch what they want and have the choice to choose what they want. So in the sense that classification is the way to go. Uh, and I think um, thirdly is uh, consultation with people that uh, make films. So when you go to, like for this happen, right? When this happened, was there any consultation with the filmmakers and the producers or with the stakeholders or was again the government deciding for, you know what's good for us you know and based on what i don't know but this whole 
consultation, if you're going to cut my film, you better well talk to me about it, you know, and at least give me the point of view. So that uh, consultation is totally missing. And of course, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just uh, rambling off here, but the important thing, other thing is, uh, actually, even the survey proves it that everybody wants an independent body. That means a, a body that regulates films that is a non-governmental, independent, and possibly self-regulating. You know, so to just depoliticize um, this whole regulation of films. And uh, just to point out that actually we do have a great model for regulating content already. And it sits with the content forum, uh, which has a content code, you know. Uh, and uh, we've been in, in the research that we did, we did kind of deeply analyze that system. And it has worked. There's not been chaos, right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. so it is a system that easily could be adopted. And it is from the 21st century and not the 18th century as the other one is. Lah. <laughs> so that's what um, we're really hoping that the um, government and home minister would look at. I mean, as for the network, uh, we're more than happy to engage and to share with the government what we have uh, found out. Yeah. All right. Anna, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Anna Ha from the Freedom Film Network there. Uh, wrapping up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night.